Welcome to this episode of Real Chemistry, where we're going to derive the wave functions for the particle in the box. This is the first simple system that's often used in quantum mechanics or physical chemistry, where we take a potential and we figure out what the electrons or particles are going to look like if we put them in that potential. And this is what the potential is. We have a well where it's zero, and then we have these walls where the potential is infinite. So what you can imagine, basically, is that you drop an electron down into a well that's infinitely deep. And we want to know how is the electron going to hang out down there. And figuring out what these wave functions are is a little complicated. It takes quite a few steps. I've broken down the process into the five key steps below. The first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to guess the general functional form of the wave function. And we're going to have some undetermined constants floating around there. We'll say, okay, it looks like it's maybe a sine function or a cosine function multiplied by some constant. We don't know what it is. And then in step two, we're going to apply boundary conditions. That is, how does our electron behave at the edges of the well, at the boundaries, to figure out a little bit more about what those constants are. We're going to then normalize the wave function we get out to figure out our last constant. And finally, we'll determine the energy eigenvalues. So let's go ahead and start. All right? Let's guess psi of x in each of our regions. So we really have two regions, right? We have region 1, where the potential is 0, that's outside of our box, and region 2, which is in the middle. And the way we're going to guess what this function looks like is using the Schrodinger equation. So in particular, it's the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So here it says if we multiply the Hamiltonian times some wave function, we'll get back out the energy times that same wave function. And remember, this guy is our Hamiltonian. So we can put that h into here, and we'll get out this guy. Basically, what we get is that we take the double derivative of some function and we multiply the potential by that same function and we'll get out its energy times a function. Okay, how is this going to tell us our wave functions? This can be particularly confusing if you haven't taken differential equations, which is not that uncommon for somebody taking quantum mechanics or physical chemistry. Well, let's first start with the regions where the potential is infinite. And then we'll get to where the potential is zero. Well, if this number here is infinitely large, then the only way this is going to have a solution is if our wave function is zero. And that should hopefully make sense. If the potential is infinitely high, we can't have an electron there. It's like putting yourself at the bottom of an infinitely tall mountain and say, get up there. It's not going to happen. So that means the electron can't be outside our well. That means that the wave function there is zero. So we've already figured out a wave function for an enormous portion of our well. The psi of x is zero outside the well. So now all we have to worry about is psi of x inside the well, and that's going to occupy the rest of our time. So let's get down to guessing some functions here. We know that the potential in the well is zero. So this whole term is going to be zero. And then a simple way to start with this guessing process is to simplify our equation by getting all the constants on one side. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and multiply both sides by 2m over negative h bar squared. And the reason we're doing that is just to get everything together. And so what we're going to get then is that the second derivative of our function psi is going to give us out 2me over h bar squared, and that's negative, times that same wave function. So what we know, let's take a look at what this is telling us. Take any function, take the derivative of it twice. You should see the same function. Not only should you see the same function, you should see some constants out there. So we have to think about what sort of function might give us that. And there's only a couple things that we can take the derivative of twice and get back the same function. So like an exponential function, we take the derivative of it twice, we'll still have an exponential. And also sine and cosine. So if I take the derivative of sine once, I get cosine. And then again, I get negative sine. So I get back the sine. And that's what this equation is saying. Take some function, take the derivative of it twice, I should get it back out. And it turns out sine and cosine are the solutions here. Now, there's some exponentials which also actually could be a solution, but if you look more closely, they actually turn out to be mathematically identical. So we're going to look at sine and cosine because if I take the derivative of sine twice, I'm going to get out negative sine. And remember, I have this negative sine here and uh, a psi there. So it turns out that the general solution here is going to be psi of x can be equal to sine times some constants x plus cosine, because cosine gives us back the same thing also. 
And now these guys can be multiplied by any number up front. That's not going to change whether or not they're solutions here. So this could be multiplied by A and this is by B. It wouldn't change the fact that when I take the derivative of it twice, I get the same function back. And now what we want to figure out is what do we want to write there? Well, the easiest thing to do is to take this mess here and to redefine it. And what we're going to do is we're going to give it a new variable, K or kappa. Those are a little different. It's actually a kappa, technically. And we're going to define kappa as the square root of 2me over h bar squared. And what that means is if we rewrite our Schrodinger equation, we're going to get out negative kappa squared psi of x. And the reason this is nice is now I don't have to think about five variables floating around or four variables floating around. I just think about kappa. Remember, when I take out the, take the derivative of sine once, it's going to kick out one constant. And when I take the derivative of sine again, it's going to kick out that same constant again. So it turns out now that the constant that should be written in here is kappa. And let me just really quickly show you that that makes sense. So let's say I take the double derivative... of sine kx. Well, the first time I take the derivative, I'm going to get out kappa uh, cosine kx. Because the derivative of sine is cosine, and then the chain rule kicks out that kappa. The next time I take the derivative, I'm going to get out negative k squared sine kx. And you'll see the same thing if I do the derivative twice with cosine. And notice this matches exactly what I'd expect. I'm starting with some function, I take the derivative twice, and I get back out the same thing times kappa squared, and it's negative. So that's going to be a solution to my Schrodinger equation. So this guy right here is the general form of our solution. Notice it has constants floating around in it that we don't know what they are. We don't know what a is going to be, we don't know what kappa is going to be, and we don't know what b is going to be. This is where our boundary conditions are going to come into play. So here's our solution. And we're going to apply boundary conditions. That is what's happening to our wave function at the edges. And the first one tells us that at the edge of the box, where uh, the x is equal to 0, that our wave function must be 0. Because remember that our wave function is totally flat before it reaches the edge of our box. Same over here, totally flat, and then it reaches the edge. And then it can do whatever it wants over here. We don't know what it's going to do. That's what we're figuring out. It's going to look like some combination of sine or cosine. But the point is, is right here at the border, where psi, for psi of 0, we know that it must be equal to 0. So that's the first boundary condition we're going to apply. We're going to say that we know that psi of 0 is equal to 0. So let's go ahead and plug in 0 where we see our x's. We get a sine k times 0 plus b cosine k, or actually kappa, times 0. Well, this is just the sine of 0, and if we go take a look at our sine function below in red, we'll see that the sine of 0 is in fact exactly 0. So this guy just drops out of our equation. And that means we don't get any information about what a is. So psi of 0 is equal to 0, um, and it's equal to b times cosine k times 0. But what is the cosine of 0? Well, if we look at the cosine of 0, that's our blue curve down below, we see that the cosine of 0 is 1. So this whole mess right here is just 1. And that means that we get that psi of 0 is equal to 0 and it's equal to b. So that means that b is 0. Because the only way our wave function can be 0 at the border is if the constant b is equal to 0. And so that means this whole part of our wave function, which we said, oh, maybe there's a cosine there, isn't there, because b is 0. So our wave function is going to be just uh, a function of sine. So now we've gotten rid of the cosine term. Now we have this. We have psi of x is equal to a sine kappa x. And we'd like to find more of the constants. Well, there's another boundary condition we can apply. We know that at uh, psi of l, it's also equal to 0. So let's apply that one. Let's plug in l for our x's. And we know that's equal to 0. And let's see what that tells us about our constants. So psi of L is equal to 0 is equal to A sine K times L. Now, when is sine equal to 0? 
because that's what we know. Basically, the only way this equation can be true is if a is zero, but that gives us the boring solution of there is no particle, because that would just mean psi of x is equal to zero, which means there's no particle in our box. So that actually is a solution to this problem. We could say there's a wave function that's possible at the bottom of that well of psi of zero, which corresponds to there's nothing there. So the only interesting solution comes when this term is equal to zero. And we want to ask ourselves, when does sine of KL equal zero? Well, if we look at our sine function down below, we'll see that sine is equal to zero at zero, at pi, at two pi. So sine of n times pi is equal to zero, where n is equal to zero, one, two, dot, 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 dot. So what we really want to know then is when is our argument in the sign up there equal to n times pi? So we want to know when is kl, that's our argument, equal to n pi. That will mean that our sine of kl will be equal to zero. Well, when is that true? Well, that's true every single time that k is equal to n pi over l. And that actually gives us more of our wave function. Now we know what kappa is equal to. So we get a sine n pi x over l. So we figured out what kappa was there. We still don't know what a is. But we've done pretty well. We've applied both of our boundary conditions, and now we have a very specific idea of what that wave function looks like. And that's pretty surprising that you can start with the Schrodinger equation and actually figure out what the electron must be doing at the bottom of this well, or what its wave functions must be. So now, how do we get this a constant? Well, it turns out the way we get a is we normalize the wave function. We often don't know the constant in front of a wave function. And I'm not going to normalize it here because it takes a little time, but I'll link to a video in the description below where I go through and normalize this. And if you do normalize it, you'll get that a is equal to square root of 2 over l. So that is our final wave function. We just figured out the different types of wave functions that can be in this well. And remember that n can take on any number, 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. So what we've really figured out is an infinite different numbers of wave functions that can exist at the bottom of the well. So we're almost done. We've figured out the wave function. Now we want to know the energy eigenvalues. The way we can do that, two ways. One is you can apply the Hamiltonian to the wave function we now know. And that actually totally works. And I'll also link to a video where I do that below. But an easier way is just to use the two different versions of kappa that we have. We know kappa is equal to m pi over l, and we know kappa is equal to the square root of 2me over h bar squared. And that's our energy. Those are our energy eigenvalues. So if I set those two equal to each other, I get n pi over l equals square root of 2me over h bar squared. Now I'm going to square both sides so that I'm going to solve for e. That's the energy of my wave functions. So that's going to give me 2me over h bar squared is equal to n squared pi squared over l squared. And now I just got to take h bar 2 and m over to the other side. So I'm going to multiply both sides by h bar squared over 2m. When I do that, I'm going to get my final expression for energy. That the energy indexed by n is equal to h bar squared n squared pi squared over 2ml squared. So that is the energy associated with each wave function. So now we solve for the energy eigenvalues and the wave functions. So here are our particle in the box solutions. We got an infinite number of wave functions and a corresponding infinite number of energy eigenvalues. And so if I pick out n equals 1, then all I have to do is plug that in for n there and n there. And I know both the lowest energy, that is n equals 1, the lowest energy wave function, and its energy eigenvalue. So here we've gone through the derivation to find the particle in the box solutions. There's all sorts of things to be said about the particle in the box. Check out some of my other videos to see that. But that's the basic solutions. Ask any questions you have below. Thanks, as always, for watching Real Chemistry. Please subscribe if you'd like to get updates about future videos. Thanks for watching.